Welcome to The Interesting Podcast, episode number 122. This episode is with Gary Nesner, who is such an interesting dude. He was an FBI agent for 30 years. On top of that, he was actually the first FBI chief negotiator. Uh, he was so cool. It was so cool to talk to him and somebody who's like lived that kind of life for so long. Uh, we talk about how he obviously worked for the FBI for 30 years, starting with uh, chasing down bank robbers and then moving into like hostage negotiations. We talk about him wanting to be an FBI agent since he was a kid. What exactly an FBI agent does, because I didn't know. Uh, we talk about the importance of being calm in tense situations. Uh, we talk about his book. He wrote a book called Stalling for Time, My Life as an FBI Hostage Negotiator, and it's so good. It's so good, and Gary actually reads the audiobook, so I highly recommend you check it out. Uh, we talk about what that was like. We talk about how the book was actually adapted into a series. It is now on Netflix, the Waco series. He talks about having Michael Shannon play him and how he actually got to share a scene with Michael Shannon at the end of the show and what it was like watching an event that he lived through. Uh, it's crazy. It's crazy. And Gary's so nice. What a cool dude. It was so cool getting to talk to him and learning about what he did and his job and just like, ah, what an interesting dude. So uh, let's just get right into it. Without further ado, please enjoy The Interesting Podcast, episode number 122 with Gary Nesner. Theme song time. I've lived in Virginia for, you know, since uh, the late 70s, but uh, no, I'm from Florida originally. And by the way, you probably know this, but you pronounce my last name Nesner. Nesner. Uh, not Nosner. But I only say it because I don't want the host to be embarrassed when they say, today we've got Gary Nosner. And I go, well, actually, it's Nesner, you know, and that <laughs> makes you seem like you didn't do your homework. But anyway. Sure. No, that's imp- does that happen a lot? Oh, yeah. My whole life, you know, so. <laughs> and, and, and I don't get offended by it, but I just, you know. Sure. No, I think it's, I think that's Correct important. I, I'm yeah. lucky that my last name is just a word with another L in it. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Balance is pretty good. Unless I have a substitute teacher, and then it's balance. Yeah, oh, jeez. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if I've ever known anybody named balance. That's interesting. Really? Is that it, is it British? It is. It is, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. So. I like the extra L because it adds more balance, you know, which coincidentally, <laughs> my wife's maiden name is more. So I was like, we should just hyphenate it. And then that oh, would be Oh, yeah, name. absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. That's perfect. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. She didn't well, go for it. It's better than her last name being out of. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Or off. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, Florida. What part of Florida? Because I've lived in Florida almost my whole life. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm from Atlantic Beach, Florida, which is in the Jacksonville area, northeast Florida. You oh, know, and I was raised there, went to school in Florida, and, you know, and then my FBI career took me to. Washington and then South Carolina and back to DC and you know and then of course I've been retired now and I live in southwestern Virginia. Sure, uh, sure. Not too far from North Carolina. Right on, right on. So then was getting into the FBI was that something that you always wanted to do like even as a kid? Yeah, I mentioned that in my book, you know. I mean, I um um I I I saw a TV show on it when I was uh, probably about 8 years old and um was pretty intrigued by what the FBI did and thought it would be a really cool career. And, you know, I started reading about it, uh, you know, and uh, it sort of became a, a dream of mine that I, I had hung on to for, you know, all my life until it happened. So I was fortunate. I was one of those that knew what he wanted to do early and it worked out. Sure. That's pretty cool. I, I find that a lot of people, like especially at a young age when they decide on something, if it sticks, it's almost like there's this destiny side of it. Because as a kid, you go through everything. You're like, I want to be a cowboy. I want to be an astronaut. I want to be a fireman. But there's a select few that's like, this is my thing, and I'm going to do that. And they end up doing pretty well, I feel. Yeah, I'm still close to a couple of my uh, childhood friends, and one of them wanted to grow up and be a Navy pilot, and that's what he was. And um, another one wanted to be a doctor, and... 
that's what he was. So we're we're sort of a bit of an anomaly, I suppose. There you go. There you go. It worked out. What was it different yeah. than you expected it to be? Because I feel like specifically the FBI, like the average person, I feel like doesn't actually know what that job is. You know, because we can attribute it to like uh, the differences between like it and like a local law enforcement. Yeah, I mean uh, the FBI. Uh, I think one of the neat things about it, there's a lot of, there's several different federal law enforcement agencies, but most of them do one thing. They, like DEA does drugs, and sure. ATF does you know firearms, and you know Customs and Border Patrol. They all have very specific mission, Secret Service. But the FBI sort of has a a, a massively broad uh, portfolio of crimes, which creates a lot of opportunity to do interesting things. You know from Foreign, foreign counterintelligence, espionage, to organized crime, to political corruption, healthcare fraud, yeah. you know, and then there's the specialties within it, like, you know, what I got into in negotiations, and there's tactical agents and forensics, and there, there's any number of things, and, um, you know, so, yeah, I mean, the, the public probably needs to know the FBI is essentially uh, focused on on investigating crimes, uh, you know, that, that fall under federal statutes, and I guess it's it's not fair because law enforcement on a local level does sophisticated things as well. But I, I think you would say if you think of the more um, expansive kinds of crimes, um, it would it'd typically be something that the FBI would be involved in, you know, fraud on a massive scale and so forth and so on. And that's obviously after 9-11, terrorism became the, the primary uh, focus of the FBI uh, for understandable reasons. So. Yeah, it just always seemed like a great career to me, and I certainly wasn't disappointed. I I didn't join to become a hostage negotiator. It didn't even exist then, but yeah. it's just sort of the way it evolved. That's cool. What did you want to do originally? Like, was there a specific side well, of the FBI? Well, I wanted to be an FBI and, and be an, an investigator, and, uh, you know, um, I, I don't think I had a clear sense of I wanted to work these things. I, I like the idea of going out and catching bad guys and then – yeah. My early career as an agent, that's what I did. I was chasing bank robbers and arresting fugitives, and I just thought this is just the greatest job in the world. You know, I just thought that was so uh, amazing to be able to do that and, um, you know, get bad guys and get them off the street. You know, typically the FBI would come involved when, uh, let's say, somebody committed a very serious crime or a murder in California, and then you find they're living in another part of the country or they're hiding out, and that's – Particularly in these days, that's the case where the FBI comes in um, be, because you can't expect, you know, 50 states to be flying its police force all over the country, you know, sure. enforcing their laws and arresting people. So so the FBI would arrest them on a fugitive warrant and then we'd be, you know, extradite them back to California, you know, Michigan, wherever it was. So, yeah, so it was an interesting career. Yeah, that's cool. Was it cool being called an agent? Yeah, I mean, um, even to this day, you know, I mean... Um, it still has a certain aura and panache. I know yeah, I there's some, some I think, short-sighted political attacks on the FBI now for purely partisan reasons Sure, uh, that I think are pretty obvious. But other than that, through most of my life, the FBI has, has sort of been, uh, you know, held up as, as, as a, you know, a very prestigious and important job. And, you know, even to this day, if I meet somebody new and I find out I was in the FBI, you can see they begin to look at you a little differently and <laughs> want to, you know, ask about your career, and what you did. And, you know, I, I think it's natural that people uh, who are in the FBI, uh, you know, get, get comfort or pleasure or, you know, uh, enhanced self-esteem out of, of that. You know, it's, um, yeah, it's not a job that's, that's very typical, you know, and uh, so it's not surprised that people have a curiosity. Yeah, it makes sense. And I also wonder, like, for somebody who does something like that, especially in the culture that we have, that's a lot of, like, movies and, you know, things are dramatized and stuff like that. How different, like, you say you're chasing bank robbers, right? So, like, how different is actually doing that versus, like, what's portrayed in movies and stuff like that? Well, Hollywood, uh, yeah. and, you know, I was just involved in, in that, the, the Waco TV show that you may want to talk about, but, um, you know, Hollywood has uh, a, a certain requirements and limitations. They have to build a lot of drama and condense things that take over a significant span of time into a short span of time. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's a lot of often tedious, um, you know, hard work in the background to locate people that you're looking for to uncover the a crime that you're investigating and then 
the dramatic moments of the arrest or the <laughs> courtroom scene, you know, in, in the totality of things, it's a fairly short uh, bit of your actual time, but it's certainly the most dramatic and memorable. And that's what people focus on. But it's, you know, it's a, uh, there's there's a great satisfaction, I think, uh, in, in any law enforcement uh, investigative capacity where you're, you know, you're, you're putting a lot of hard work into bringing someone to justice that's, you know, ripping off the public, uh, you know, is uh, creating a danger to, to the to someone else, um, you know, violating laws in a significant way. I mean, we're not going after pickpockets and jaywalkers. So, right. you know, so the people that that the FBI investigates are, are typically engaged in some, you know, fairly serious, uh, crime. Yeah, that makes sense. Cause it's kind of like the hierarchy of it. And I didn't realize that FBI agents are like a local law enforcement. You have like your jurisdiction and then it's like, you can't police the entire U S and you got to do departments. So you guys are kind of like, we got this. That's pretty cool. It's pretty fun. Well, and it's evolved a little bit. You know, when I was a young agent, you know, in the seventies, I think the FBI's role was a little um, loftier then, in a sense, because with the relative uh, limitations on communications, right? You know, these small and there's thousands of police departments in the United States. They just didn't have the capacity to have the infrastructure in the system to work complex cases, much less work them if they crossed multiple state lines or even international. Right. So. Those were things that that naturally, you know, fell under the, uh, you know, the purview of the FBI, and and that was the unique role that we provided to assist law enforcement. We also, uh, back in those days, provided a, a bulk of of training for police departments. They didn't have money ah. to, to bring in, you know, expensive instructors, and so the FBI, and still does, provides that training for free to law enforcement. Part of the FBI's mission. And more so, I think, in the past than even today, was to make local law enforcement better. Yeah. You know, Congress gave us the tools to do that. And, uh, you know, I, a good bit of my career was, was expended into training police how to be, oh, cool. in my, my area, better negotiators. So, you know, we didn't charge them for that. They don't pay for it. They just, they just come. Sure. So we, or we go there. That's cool. It's like one hand washes the other. I'm into that. Yeah. What kind of schooling does it take to be an FBI agent? Like, what training do you have to do to do that? Yeah. Well, the, the myth of sorts that I think has carried over since Hoover's days was that every FBI agent was an attorney or an accountant. Yeah. <laughs> and um, it's certainly never true in my lifetime, although those are sort of fast-track specialties. If you are a CPA or an attorney, you, you, you get some... Uh, points for being more likely to be hired. But, you know, in my estimation, we've never had probably more than 20% of, of the total agent population that fit into one or both of those categories. Oh. But basically, you have to have a college degree. You have to have three years work experience. You have to uh, pass the, you know, knowledge test and physical fitness and firearms and, you know, a whole range of things and extensive background investigation. Fair. Um, so, so those are the basic components to become an FBI agent. Okay, right on. Right and you've got to be willing to live anywhere they want you to live. You know, yeah. I mean, I, I've, I've often been asked by people, I want to be one of those FBI agents. And I said, well, okay, but just understand, you know, you live here in beautiful San Diego, you may find yourself in New York City or Cleveland or Detroit or maybe a place that you don't think is so very nice. And you could be stuck there for a good many years before you, you get the seniority to maybe transfer back to where you would like to be. So, and there's no guarantees. So it's the, the needs of the FBI and you know, that's the way it goes. Sure. It's kind of like the military in that, like every few years Very you get much. restationed. That's pretty neat. Yeah. The military has a, a little different setup and they, they move their people around a lot more yeah. frequently than, uh, the, the FBI that used to, uh, transfer people, probably a typical career where you, you'd move three, four times. If you're going to administration, uh, management, as it were, you probably moved ten times, but um, yeah. that's gotten so expensive that they have really <laughs> uh, cut back on that a little bit, and that's probably a good idea. But you know, there are people that get stuck in places they don't want to be for an awful long time, and it's the way it goes. Yeah, part of the job. That's the part they don't tell you about. Exactly. Yeah, that's pretty interesting. 
So how do you, having had, because you were an FBI agent for how long? Decades. 30, I was in the FBI for 30 years. 30 years. That's a long time. Did, it, did the job? <laughs> you are not, Gary. Get <laughs> out of here. <laughs> uh, I mean, it's, it is a long time. And, it, you know, you, you're a young man and, and you can't really fathom that yet. But No, I'm not even 30 years you know, old. <laughs> you know, you just realize, um, you know, when you get to be my age that um, time is such a precious commodity and it just races by. And, uh, yeah. you know, it just seems like we were having our family and we have three kids and now – we have six soon to be seven grandchildren and where did that time go you know and uh, sure and it seems like i just retired from the fbi and now it's been uh, 17 years i've been retired a long time wow from the FBI. so yeah i mean i still work but um sure yeah it's just the only you get you appreciate health yeah time, <laughs> sure and, and hopefully you know financial security to do what you need to do and pay your bills but uh those are th- commodities that you don't necessarily have for a very long period of time and not everybody has them ever so yeah um yeah you knock on wood as it were do you doing a job like that does it change how you view like people in general because you're kind of especially as a negotiator you're meeting them on like the worst day of their life so like yeah exactly i mean i i think it does i mean i i would like to say that um the the primary skills we use as a negotiator are, are good listening skills yeah and uh, people think, oh, you know, that guy's a good bullshitter. Train him to yeah. be a negotiator. Say, well, we're not looking for a bullshitter. We're looking for a good empathic listener. Yeah. So I, I would like to think that in my better moments, it's it's made me a better person and a better friend and so forth and so on. My, my wife, I'm sure, would yeah. on a different podcast uh, yeah. express a somewhat different perspective. But, um, you know, you do the best you can. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So when you went in, you're chasing do you find that are criminals smarter or dumber than they are in the movies are they masterminds <laughs> uh, generally generally they're not as bright as they're depicted um, yeah <laughs> in fact uh, yeah, that that's one of the great things we have going for us is they're generally not as smart as yeah. we are <laughs> and and that's not to say we're einsteins it's just um you know if people are engaged in in some sort of criminal activity whether it's you know fraud or political ru- corruption they uh, they keep doing it long enough and, you know, chances are they're going to get caught and there's going to be some weak link that, uh, leads the case back to them. And, um, you know, that, that works to our advantage. You know, I mean, I, I can't say crime never pays for anybody, but, uh, you know, typically it, it's not a smart business. You know, I, I, I teach negotiations and one of the factors that comes into play are kidnappings. And sure. when I, when I was a young agent, um, in the United States, there was um, a, a fair amount of kidnaps for money in this country. Mm-hmm. That's almost unheard of today, and yeah. and in the re, it's still prevalent overseas in the developing world and mm-hmm. places where they don't have good criminal justice system or police corruption. But in this country, the the bad guys who have kidnapped your child, if you're a wealthy person, have to some point pick up the money. They have to get uh, what they want. <laughs> sure. And with today's technology and surveillance techniques and any number of things, it, it's pretty darn impossible. You've seen on the movies where they say, well, keep them on the phone longer so we can trace the call. Well, with digital technology, that happens real quick now. Yeah. <laughs> so for all these reasons, smart criminals have said, you know, I'm going to get into another specialty within yeah. <laughs> my criminal profession because this one, the odds of succeeding are extremely low. Sure. It's time to diversify your crime portfolio. Exactly. <laughs> Got to change with the time. That's exactly. pretty neat. Is there any cases that come to mind over your career that were like particularly difficult to crack? Or the ones that you spent a lot of time on? We don't have enough time on this podcast. Yeah. Correct? <laughs> That's I mean, fair. That's fair. <laughs> no, particularly in through uh, most of the eighties, uh, I worked overseas hijackings, terrorist hijacking, and it was a fairly new um, uh, area for the FBI to investigate. Mm-hmm. And um, I mean, you can imagine the difficulty of investigating a very complex crime committed mostly by Middle East terrorists. That sure where they operate out of countries that we were not operating and had 
um, you know, a, a limited ability to gather the information we needed and, and bring these cases to trial, identify the perpetrator. So, I mean, almost all of those cases were a huge challenge. And um, yeah, so that that's that's for sure. That makes sense. You're definitely operating on another board as well. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So at what point did you decide to switch into negotiation? Well, it wasn't so much a switch. Um, it In most of the FBI, there's 56 field offices around the country for the FBI, and each one headed by a special agent charge, which is like a general. Mm-hmm. But within each of those offices, and they vary in size, you know, Chicago versus you know, uh, Des Moines or something like that. Um, each, each office has a, a tactical team, a SWAT team that would respond if the, there's a bank robbery or a hijacking or some special needs. And each office will have a cadre of trained negotiators. Mm-hmm. There's 350 of them around the FBI. So I was one of those for the Washington field office of the FBI, not the headquarters, the Washington field office, which oh. was one of the largest field offices. Yeah. So I did that as a part-time function. I'm investigating Middle East terrorism. And if there was an incident in which the FBI was involved or asked to assist the police, then in addition to training the police, I would go out and help or assist or play a role or be involved in the incident. So doing that for quite some years, for about 10 years, I had sort of established that it's something that I was competent at and uh, successful at. And uh, so at a certain juncture in 1990, I was asked to become one of the, uh, at what was then three full-time FBI negotiators who were based at the FBI Academy. And so I worked there, again, same thing, doing research, uh, responding operationally and, and conducting training. And then after the Waco incident in 93, I was made the, the chief negotiator for all of the FBI in a expanded standalone unit. So I ended up having 10 full-time negotiators working for me. So that's sort of the evolution. I didn't start out to be a, a full-time negotiator. It just sort of happened in a serendipitous way. That's cool. Was So was the negotiating part, was that something that like you came up with? Like maybe we should try coming at it from this angle? No, no. It's I'd like to say I did, but you know, it really... <laughs> Um, it really started by the New York City Police Department, uh, Frank Bols and Harvey Schlossberg. They came up with this concept, and uh, you know, it was basically a bargaining concept. You, you're holding a hostage, and you know, you're getting hungry, and I'll trade you a hamburger for one of your hostages. I mean, that's sort of the sure. concept in a nutshell: quid pro quo bargaining. Mm-hmm. And um, you know, the the FBI uh, saw its merit and uh, immediately stole it for lack of a better word or <laughs> steal from the best <laughs> copied it. and then of course with our resources we were able to gather information data on it not only nationally but worldwide and that greatly expanded our knowledge base on the best way to do it and um the best approaches to take if you're dealing with a suicidal person say versus a mentally ill person so we really began to take the the international lead as being the um, the place where there was the best information on how to do this. And we trained it all over the world. And uh, it it is a concept. Uh, and again, I give New York City credit for starting it. It's a concept that's saved literally, I mean, thousands of lives. We can't even, we don't even know. But it's, it's quite clear that it's been one of the most successful things uh, in law enforcement. It, it probably resolved things peacefully in the 90 percentile, which is... Wow. A lot higher than anything else we do in law enforcement, I think. <laughs> sure. Other than maybe uh, consume donuts, I don't know. We may leave in that, too. Right, but, uh, right. I'll, I'll give your merits. You got it. <laughs> that's cool. I think that says a lot about, like, anyone who's willing to take that route as well. It's like it matters how you win kind of thing, you know what I mean? As opposed to just charging in and doing things that way. To add the negotiation well, level, I think it's pretty cool. You know, the real reason it evolved and the reason we do it is is to save lives. Not, yeah. not only – and, of course, by saying that, you, you are assuming I'm, I'm meaning the the hostages and the hostage taker. And, you know, really only 10 percent of these are really even hostage situations. They're more far more likely to be um, emotionally driven situations where somebody really doesn't have a demand. They may be threatening someone else, but technically it's not a hostage situation unless there is a demand and a quid pro quo. Regardless, we do it and resolve it uh, so our tactical people don't have to go in 
Sure. And, uh, you know, get into a very dangerous, you know, confrontation with deadly firearms and either be killed or have to kill the perpetrator. And sadly, there's been cases where police have sadly killed a hostage, you know, in yeah. error. So if we invest the time in, you know, uh, lowering the emotional engagement of, of the conflict, uh, we can steer this person towards thinking a little bit more clearly and behaving in a more rational manner. And a very high percentage of the time we, we achieve uh, a successful outcome that, you know, shows the public that we're not just a bunch of cowboys and, uh, <laughs> you know, we do, uh, we, we put a high regard on life and, um, you know, th and that's how the way we work it. So, yeah, I was very proud to be part of that process throughout the, the country and the world. Yeah, you should be. I think it's cool. Was it something that like you were naturally good at or did you have to work it over time or can this be taught? Yeah, it's like the <laughs> question of uh, nurture versus nature, you know? Yeah. And um, I mean, I like to think that I have some uh, personality characteristics that, um, you know, had a positive impact on my ability to do this, but I can there's no it. question. I've, I've benefited a great deal from the training I got and the experiences I had. Every time we worked an incident, it became in essence a, a learning laboratory. Um, sure. Yeah. A, a lot of, a lot of what we do as negotiators is, um, you know, is it an art or is it a science? And I say, yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's sure. both. <laughs> you know, I, I give an example, you know, a, a very typical thing we used to confront was you'd have some desperate person barricaded and you're trying to get them to come out and say his mother would show up and say, if you just let me talk to my son, right. I can get him to come out. And the fact of the matter is, if you did that, who knows, maybe she could. But we have dozens and dozens of case examples that as soon as mom gets on the phone, the person says, goodbye, mom, I loved you, you know, give cousin Ernie my baseball collection or card yeah. collection, whatever it is. So we don't want to give them that opportunity to say their last will and testament to say goodbye. Sure. Now, the family doesn't understand it. They say, oh, no, no, no. He, 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 if I tell him to come out, he'll come out. Well, fine. But, you know, we, we don't. It's a risk. First of all, it doesn't sound like your family relationship is exactly <laughs> warm and cozy one anyway. So, yeah. so those are the kinds of things by trial and error. You know, we, we can't definitively say in this particular instance, in this particular set of circumstances, mom wouldn't be successful, but we know statistically there's right. great risk in that. And we don't take those risks unless, you know, unless there's special reason to do so. That makes sense. That was something I, I, I've seen the Waco series and that was something that when that happened, they, they bring that up that what the mom yeah. came in and was like, just let me talk to him. I was like, that is genius. You're absolutely right. Cause that gives them time to kind of close loose ends. Be like, all right, cool. Now I have nothing left to do. So that's, that's sounds like a hard lesson to learn. On how to well, do this there's a lot things. of those, and you know, in, in an awful lot of the negotiation playbook um, is to some extent based on the recognition of past mistakes. And, yeah, um, totally. You know, in the early days, some negotiators were killed by you know walking up to the front door with their hands in the air and say, "Let's talk," and boom, the guy kills him. And we say, "Well, maybe we shouldn't be doing that." Yeah. You know, maybe, maybe we should send in a telephone and and talk to him from a safe, uh, you know, secure barricaded position. So, you know, these are the lessons you learn through time. And, and if you don't learn from them, then and shame on you for not, uh, you know, taking your profession seriously. Sure. Sure. Speaking of time, your book is real good, man. It's Thanks. real good. I liked it a lot. I also love that you read the audiobook. Anytime an author does the audiobook for it, I immediately go for that because it's like, I want to hear the author's intent and like you wrote it. So like, why write a book? How long did it take you? Yeah. Well, um, uh, your last question, it took me about a year to write the book, and I was already contracted by Random House, now Penguin Random House, to do it. Mm -hmm. um, the book was out for almost eight years in hardback and, um, and ebook uh, versions. And then when the Waco TV series first came out on the Paramount Network almost two years ago, they uh, – um, Random House decided to put it into paperback mm -hmm. and uh, audiobook. 
Nice. And so they, they sent me the samples of a couple readers, and they said, which which of these guys do you like as reading the book? And I said, well, they, you know, they're all they're all good. You know, I I ranked them, and I said, but you know, if you like, I'm happy to read it myself. And uh, nice they said, job. you would? And I said, yeah. And so I ended up doing it, but that was the significantly more difficult than I thought it would be. I bet. I bet. Even I bet. reading even reading words that you wrote, yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, you yourself wrote and, and getting the pacing and everything. It's, it, it, you know, it took several days to do it. And I was fortunate to have a great, um, uh, tech technical editor that, that walked me through the process and helped it from becoming a total disaster. You know, yeah. so. <laughs> I'd say it worked out. I'd say it worked out. It's a, well, great, so. it's a great book. It's it's interesting to get the perspective of somebody who's lived the life that you lived in these crazy situations. And like the intent was like a big thing for me that I was like, this is really, really cool. Like when you talk about certain situations where things had to go the violent option and you were talking about how like you were really upset because you didn't want it to go that way. And I just thought that was a really cool thing about you as a person that like you're trying everything you can to not get to that conclusion and then when it does happen, you're like, ah, man, as opposed to being like, well, you know, it happened. You know, it showed you cared yeah, that came through in the writing. You know, uh, po police officers are, are sort of seen as as being a little detached and sometimes sometimes cold and, you know, maybe not so sympathetic towards bad guys doing bad things. Yeah. But, you know, for everyone, else, there's there's another police officer that just wants everybody to come out without getting hurt. And, um, I agree. You know, these tend to be experienced, uh, confident, uh, police officers and agents who are good interviewers, good interrogators. They're good source developers. Mm -hmm. You know, the whole job in law enforcement is essentially getting information and cooperation sure. and negotiation skills are probably the best ones to, to deploy in, in obtaining that goal. And, um, you know, you just, you realize it's just better off for everybody. If I get this, I mean, I, you know, I'm not going to follow through with this guy's whole life and see what kind of prison sentence he gets. And if, does he come out a better person? You know, I'm more into triage, you know, and, and like in a medical context, just want to get him out of this situation now. Right. And, and sure he doesn't hurt anybody else. And if I've done that, then, you know, that's my job. And hopefully someone in the system at some other level can, take on the long-term challenges of this person's, uh, you know, less than stellar personality. Yeah. Yeah. And the other thing that you put in the book that I really like the, the conceptualization of it all, where you talked about, you'd wake up really early in the morning to a quiet neighborhood, go have this crazy day. And then you would come back and the neighborhood was still the same. It's like, how do you wrap your head around the idea that you lived like this bubble of a life that's so different than everything else? Yeah, I mean, I don't know. It, you know, it becomes routine to you. And, um, you know, the the trauma surgeon that shows up for work and deals with some horrendous, uh, you know, personal injury from people that are carted in after a car accident or something. Sure. That's that's their normal business. If it happened to you or I, we, we probably wouldn't know what to do. We'd be frozen with inaction and you know, have bad dreams about it for the rest of our lives, you know, but the, the yeah. doctor just gets on. It doesn't mean that they don't uh, respond to it uh, uh, on an emotional level, but, you know, they get on with the job at hand. And that that's what you do in what I used to do. I mean, I'd almost always be the first one to leave my neighborhood and the last one home at night. And mm -hmm. my neighbors were pretty savvy and knew what I did for a living and were respectful of that. And you know, we, we lived in the neighborhood, we lived in the same house for 30 years. So we had a lot of uh, longstanding friends and, and, and so forth. But yeah, I mean, it's, you have to learn how to compartmentalize things. And yet all of those things have uh, an indelible impact on you long term and probably change your outlook and your outlook in life. But, you know, the whole thing about negotiations is uh, dealing with high emotion. And, um, right. you know, I one of the chapters of my book, uh, with a partial quote from Rudyard Kipling, and if you can keep your keep your head about you, and all else are losing theirs, and that's the key ingredient that you're responding to very volatile, um, emotionally charged incidents, mm -hmm. and not only on by the perpetrator, but sometimes law enforcement is responding. One of them's been shot; they've been shot at, car chase, whatever it might be. 
Now, you've got to introduce into this some stabilizing calm to de-escalate, lower the temperature, uh, pull back from the confrontation, and begin to find out what's making this person tick. Uh, and you do that by listening to them and responding to them, not arguing with them, not belittling them. And eventually they get to a point where um, they trust that you'll treat them fairly and with dignity and, you know, and they come out. And, and it's not a, you know, it's not a hidden secret. We're not getting into their minds and yeah. <laughs> speaking them out. It's just building a relationship of trust and, you know, being trustworthy and likable and genuine and sincere and how you say something is more important than what you say, you know, right. uh, coming across somebody, in fact, we always ask perpetrators, what did I say that made you come out? And they always say the same thing. I can't remember, but I like the way you said it, you know, and that, that sure. tells you a lot there because th those are the cues we have as human beings. You know, we're, we're, we're assessing people constantly, mostly unconsciously, but sometimes consciously. And we're saying, this person, as they present themselves to me, seems decent and trustworthy. They're interested in what I have to say. They seem to understand what I'm going through, why I'm angry, sure, what caused me to do this. And that's the pathway to getting the cooperation. And, you know, it's not rocket science, but yeah. <laughs> you know, being able to do that in a tense situation is, you know, can be difficult for some people. Not everybody can. Most of us uh, can can employ some of these skills pretty effectively, but for others, it takes more work than, than some. Yeah, that makes sense. I feel like that intent of care comes through as well. It's like, you know, they say like when people give off vibes, you know, it's like they're not saying anything, but like you're getting something from it. It's, it's subconscious, like you said. So yeah, that, that's that's pretty interesting that it would make sense. It's, it's the way that you say it that would make them more like, okay, you're not coming at me with the anger that I'm putting out because then that just people butt heads. There's no way to get out of that one well well that that's right and and even you know new negotiators are often um frozen within action because they're scared they're going to say the wrong thing and trigger violence right. from this person in reality uh, every negotiation will involve the negotiator probably saying something that in hindsight they wish they had said a little differently right so it will make mistakes but what's really going to carry the day uh is is your overall demeanor and the presentation of your sincerity and genuineness and you're also in in these instances presenting a face of law enforcement that these guys don't expect because most of them have had good point less than a positive experience with law enforcement in the past sure and they're expecting you to be very uh, command voice uh, telling them what they have to do being almost threatening and challenging and instead it's like Hi, my name's Gary, and I want to help you out. What's what's going on in there? Can you tell me what what happened between you and your girlfriend? Whatever it might be, and it uh, it, it really opens up their receptivity to uh, telling you more and allowing you to make some suggestions at a certain point. You know, if a perpetrator all of a sudden says to me, "I, I just don't know what to do," well, I mean, to me, I've just heard a really neat thing. I'm saying. Well, have you thought about this? Because now I've gotten to the point in our interaction where he's looking for some guidance or right. some or validation. You know, we typically face ambivalence. Part of a part of the person wants to live. Part of them wants to die. I mean, that's a very common thing for us. Mm -hmm. So we're dealing with a balance of emotions, and of course, we want to tip them towards the. You know, we we can we can make something better out of what's happening to you today. You know, we can, right. Don't, don't make a permanent solution to a short term problem. Yeah. You know? Sure. Sure. You get to facilitate that. Is it, you're one of the, the, I was definitely minority of the people in the world that have had someone play them in something. Is that, <laughs> is that crazy weird? You got Michael Shannon, who's like one of the best actors to ever do. I, it. I know. I, you know, and I didn't have a lot of, uh, uh, knowledge about Michael. I'd seen him in Boardwalk Empire, oh, and nice. uh, and I and I and I remember saying to my wife, uh, "I said, wow, that is such an interesting guy." And had this long before they were talking about him playing me, mm -hmm. you know. And I kind of forgot about it. And then they said Michael Shannon. And I go, Michael Shannon. Oh, that's that guy, you know. <laughs> now he plays a pretty heavy guy there, so I wasn't sure how that would work out. But 
I think he was absolutely brilliant. And, Agreed. you know, I got to meet him for the first time on set and we, you know, we became pretty good friends. We, we went out every night to drink and dinner, you know, and, cool. um, he's a really amazing actor. And, um, yeah, I was, how can I complain about the portrayal he had, but while not trying to imitate me, I think he, he really captured the tone and demeanor of, and the underlying feelings I have about this business and how it should be run. And for that, I'll be eternally grateful for that portrayal. Yeah, I thought it was cool. I'm definitely getting, I'm getting the vibes speaking of, and that's one of the things that brought me to you as well. It's like, I want to know who's the real guy and then listen to your book. And I was like, Oh, got it on my show. Have to have to. That's neat though. To It's about the tone. Like he wasn't imitating you specifically, but it was you and it was an accurate portrayal because it, you were coming through it. Oh, that's pretty yeah, neat. And, and, you know, uh, I didn't realize it, but, you know, I guess to look at the scripts, but I didn't help write them. Right. But I was so shocked at how many of my words from the book or my sayings from videos of me they watched given presentations were embedded in the script. Yeah. So it's, a little, it's more than a little bizarre to see. Yeah. <laughs> I bet. You know, someone playing you say your words. And, um, yeah, on that part it was excellent. I mean, I have some some concerns about the production, but I thought that was great. And uh, you know, the other actors were equally yeah uh, enjoyable to be around. And and I saw some performances that just kind of took your breath away. Um, you know, Shea Wiggum when he's trying to dig that woman out of the bus. Yeah, uh, I, I was standing right there watching them film that. And when they they did it two or, two or three times. And after each one, there was just total silence on the set. Wow. You know, the emotion that both of them put into that scene. And and I, for the first time in my life, I think really recognized, boy, these really good actors are, <laughs> you know, you know, it's like cut. OK, do it again, you know, and, yeah. and they, they replicate, you know, and it's just quite amazing to see. And uh, yeah, yeah. So it was um, an interesting thing to be involved in. And of course, at the end. I don't know if you noticed, uh, they gave me a cameo of being able to yeah, uh, be the guy that comes out of the congressional hearing and says, <laughs> to the guy playing me, Gary Nessner, they're ready for your testimony, you know, and uh, <laughs> I was able to memorize and retain that line. They don't have, didn't have to film it too many times, but that was, that was pretty good because they wanted to give me a cameo and they said, I said, well, what are you going to have me give him coffee or something like that? And they said, no, that stuff always gets cut. We want something that'll stay in the final cut. And they came up with that idea. And, um, yeah, it was really nice. And in fact, David Thibodeau, who's the branch Dravidian who survived, he's in that same scene sitting on a bench oh. next to Rory Col Culkin, who, yeah. uh, Col who played him. And that was kind of cool. So they had all, both of us and the actors portraying us in the same scene at the end. That was pretty clever. I thought. Yeah. So strange how it must have been because you lived through the actual thing and then you're watching a representation of the actual thing. It's like, what is what is going on? Yeah, and how many times in a cameo do you get to say your own name to the person saying it? Yeah, it, you know? <laughs> yeah it's, it's true. It's a whole other level. <laughs> I remember the first scene I saw Mike uh, portray me was, I think the first episode, it was the uh, one of the Ruby Ridge scenes and... Mm -hmm. He walks up to somebody and says, "Hi, I'm Gary Nestor," and I'm going, "No, you're not." You know, I'm, <laughs> I, that's. Yeah. So it takes a while to get used to that. Yeah, I bet. I bet when you are a character, but then you're you. That's crazy. Yeah. That's so crazy. Well, he's a tremendous guy, and I, uh, you know, when I go up to New York, we we get together for dinner or whatever, and um, I, I really am very fortunate to have had a chance to uh, to meet him. That's cool. That's cool. So given your massive experience that you've had, do you find that there's a particular quality that makes for a good agent? Because there's a bunch, I'm sure. Well, a good agent, you know, that that's a broader category. But if, if I can change your question to a, what makes a good negotiator, yeah, right? I mean, totally. I think the, the number one uh, personality attribute would be self-control. Oh, I mean, good you one. know, I, I, that's actually the very first thing. I teach classes, well, when I was teaching negotiation classes, I haven't done that for a while, but, but you know, it's, you know, the, the premise is that if, if you can't control your own emotions, 
how can you begin to expect to influence someone else? I mean, if you get angry when they're unpleasant to you and you respond in kind, well, you've just, you're making the situation worse. So you've got to have that discipline and self-control to uh, not take things personally, to be not so thin skinned. Um, and you know, that's, I think the number one attribute I know some of our politicians are extremely thin skinned and yeah. <laughs> are, are, are quick to attack somebody anytime there's criticism. And I, I, I just think it's a terrible approach to take. I agree. I agree. It, so for, do you have any advice then for people that are like joining now that want to do the, join, what you did? Join the FBI? Yeah. Like you know, the I, new guys. I think, I, I go back to uh, the, the two primary requirements. It doesn't matter what uh, investigative specialty you're assigned to. Mm-hmm. An FBI agent's job is getting information. Mm. And and you get that information through cooperation. How do you get the cooperation? Whether you're interviewing a college president, you know, the CEO of a large corporation, a wino in the gutter, you know, or a serial murderer – it's the same approach, you know, be respectful, be genuine, listen, don't condemn or judge. And um, that's the pathway that's most likely to help you obtain that information that we need to complete our investigation, to find the next step in the investigation, to get the person's cooperation that we need, whether it could be a witness. It's not always an adversary. You know, it's somebody that um, has some important information about a, a crime. How do we deal with them? I remember early in my career, you'd have to interview a very nervous bank teller who had just been robbed 10 minutes before. Oh yeah. You know, so how you, how you help them calm down to where their memory is more precise and, and not just for your partisan reasons of getting information, but to be a comfort to them as well. You know, I mean, some of them have some really bizarre ideas. Well, is, is he's going to come back and kill me, you know? And, you know yeah. You know, that's not the kind of thing that we see, you know. But try to be reassuring and, and supportive. And, you know, uh, it means a lot to these people. And um, obviously some agents are naturally good at it. Others are competent with effort and experience and training. And then there's some that are just never going to be good at this. It's just yeah. not. <laughs> it's just, it's just not. Sure, it's conflicting personality. Well, I, th- I think that's a cool legacy to leave behind, like what you've instituted in an already crazy big institution. Like you, you've left your mark, and I think that's pretty cool. So we'll well, thank you. I mean, I don't want to take credit for inventing all of this stuff. I certainly yeah. had my, <laughs> you know, I, I'm not the McDonald's brothers. I didn't invent right. the milk cake, <laughs> but, but I may be Ray Kroc in the sense that I franchised it a little bit. There you bit, go. So. There you go. You gave it the mass appeal it needed. <laughs> I'm it's not a, even sure if that's true, but whatever. I'll I'll accept. I'll give point. it to you. I'm gonna give it to Thank you regardless. You. Thank you. <laughs> well, Thank dude, you. this was really really cool. Thank you so much for hanging out and talking to me, and like it was cool getting to know you, man. And and well done. Congrats on an awesome career. Uh, Thank you. Before I let you go, is there anywhere people can find you online? Do you have any social media or anything like that? Yeah, I mean, I, on Facebook, I have a page called Stalling for Time. Um, I also I'm on LinkedIn. Um, and uh, m- uh, most importantly is my website, which is, you know, uh, www.garynessner.com. So um, N-O-E-S-N-E-R, uh, one word, Gary Nessner. And, uh, you know, there's all kinds of interviews and, you know, articles I've written and uh, podcasts I've done. And I'll probably post yours there, too, if you'll send me the link at some point in time. Of course. So, yeah. So... You know, that's uh, that's a source of information. And, you know, it's interesting. I just did a Reddit, uh, which I'd never oh, cool. been involved in. A Reddit AMA, Ask Me Anything, Yeah, uh, about a week ago. And I had like 500 people on there. And, you wow. know, I, I typed pretty fast. So I, uh, I answered an awful lot of questions. And then, you know, and then I shut it off But uh, after an hour and a half. But then I go back and I look at some of the things later on and also got some private messages most people are supportive and appreciative, but, you know, there's people call me a baby killer and I hope your family burns in hell. And, mm-hmm. you know, and, Always. and I would just say to your listeners, you know, it's it's really easy to be unkind on social media, you know, and, and yeah. we've all had some challenges dealing with people on social media. And I, you know, I 
probably made uh, my share of mistakes as well. But but we all get heated up these days. But, you know, just stop to think that, uh, you know, issues are complex. And, yeah. uh, you know, when we look back at Waco, um, you know, it's um, it, it, it's not a black and white story. Uh, they're all a bunch of crazy cultists and deserve what they got. Or no, they were good people, and the FBI was all evil and just wanted to come out there and kill everybody. Right. That's fine. If if you're if you're kind of superficial and you have a preconceived notion and you're going to hold on to that, that's fine. But if you really want to study things and gather information and 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 be reality based and learn the facts, you'll see that it's clearly a tragedy. And there were good and bad decision making on both sides. I've always been a critic of some of the FBI decisions, but at the end of the day, I hold David Koresh responsible for it because he had the power sure. every day to lead his people out safely. And we encouraged him to do so. We made whatever concession he wanted in order to happen. Um, so, you know, let's balance things out here. And, uh, you know, because he was bad doesn't mean we were perfect. Right. Yeah. <laughs> There's a lot of because fault. He was bad. It doesn't mean his followers were all bad. And you know, it's just, I find life is complex. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I was interviewed in a book that came out, I don't know, about two years ago called uh, nonsense colon, the power of not knowing. Fantastic. And what it, and I was profiled in it along with others. And it basically said successful people are comfortable working in gray. Ooh. We, we don't feel compelled. If you get hold of those authors, that'd probably be a good guest for your show. Yeah. Uh, it it says that you know a lot of us that are successful in, in various disciplines in in life, um, we don't have to have precise, absolute uh, opinions on everything. It's okay to be unsure. Yeah. I learned that a long time ago as an instructor. You know. Yeah. <laughs> Burly cop ask you a question about negotiations and it's okay to say, you know, I don't know. You yeah. Know? I'm not sure. I guess it depends. Yeah. You know, this is what I would be thinking about. This could go well. And then I see where that might cause a problem. So I'm not sure what I would do. That's okay. Yeah. That's okay. That, that is a great note to go out on. I think there's a lot of strength and power in being confident enough to say, I don't know. It's like, it's so much better to be like, I'm not sure than to be like, it's this and it's not. It's like, well, that's right. just, it's okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, absolutely. I mean, I think, you know, not to get in a whole different discussion, but I think when people think about religion, it's, it's important apparently in the human psyche that people say, this is exactly what this is and sure, where we sure. come from and where we're going. And then there's other people say like, gee, you know, I'm not really sure, you know, maybe, maybe not. Okay. Right. A perfectly reasonable position to take unless you have this absolute uh, unyielding confidence in whatever it is that you believe in you know but for most human beings um, th things are not so crystal clear all the time so that would that's the tip of the day for your listeners I love it I love it beautiful and Hello, friends. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of The Interesting Podcast. If you'd like to follow the show, it's at Pod of Interest on Twitter. If you'd like to follow me, I'm at Jedi Brian on all social media sites. You can also find me at brianbalance.com. That's balance with two L's. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it and tell your friends. A good rating or review always helps. Let them know we've got some cool stuff going on over here. Speaking of cool stuff, we now have merch. Just search The Interesting Podcast on tpublic.com to get you some sweet gear. Also, I made a Patreon. So if you'd like to support the show and get access to other exclusive shows about a bunch of random things, you can now do that at patreon.com slash jedibrian. On that note, special thanks to Chris, Ben, Jim, Daz, Kelly, Daryl, Logan, Victor, JC, and Christina. Your support means so much to me, and I cannot tell you how much I appreciate it. So until next time, be well.